Hello, today on my channel you will hear an amazing story about life. I hope you enjoy this story. This one struck me to the core. Honestly, I still can't forget it. Enjoy watching. Selena knew her sister-in-law hated her. Not just can't stand her, or dislikes her, or can't get along, she hated her. But how, when had it started? Selena couldn't answer that if she wanted to, and lately, she hadn't even felt the urge to do so, all the strength her fading, shattering consciousness had directed to the fact that she was still feeling human, and how hard it was. How many times? How can one live like this at all, I ask you? The daughter-in-law's ring, shrill voice came through the two closed doors from the kitchen. I'm tired of being a bum. You've turned me into a slave. Why did you do this to me? And you said you love me. Selena frantically crumpled the bedspread in her naughty fingers. If Elizabeth had gone out early in the morning, then it was going to be a long day. It meant she would probably feed her lunch again in such a way that it would be better to starve. Her sister-in-law would bring food that was cold or scalding hot, and she would show every spoonful into the woman's mouth in such a way that the steel hit her teeth and it hurt. What a witch, she could say, because she knew the infirm mother-in-law wouldn't be able to pass a word to her son anyway. You eat like a wolf, and you're still as skinny as ever. And I'm suffering, I can't lose weight. When will you leave us alone, eh? When will you release our family? Please tell me, a terminally ill person has been found. Wiping her mother-in-law's mouth with a napkin, Elizaveta usually croaked now her hands should be washed with soap and water, it's disgusting to come into contact with a sick aunt. And if she was in a bad mood, then she would not come in for a long time. Selena burned with humiliation had to endure for hours until her daughter-in-law came again to serve the ship. In general, to the woman's hand was tied a rope leading to a bell so that she could pull and call if necessary. It was my son's idea. Except that in his absence Elizabeth's hearing was always very convenient for her, and she went in, well, when she wanted to. And she loved to be a witness to any shame of her mother-in-law, to have something to poke you, you dirty pig, could not call, instead of dirtying the bed? Of course, what's it to you? Elizabeth grinned. It's not for you to do the washing. You can lie there all day long, doing nothing. Oh, Selena didn't expect to live like this in her old age, or live to live. The doctor said that, theoretically, she could spend more than a year in such a state. Once, a long time ago, Selena assumed that she could, of course, become infirm and a burden to her relatives, but at the age of 90, not 55. And how had it come to this? She often thought about it, and the answer was simple and ruthless at the same time. It just happened, by chance, and there was no one to blame for it. Selena was born in Chicago, and her family was the most intelligent from any angle, so prominent teachers, scientists, and artists. In view of the inclinations of young Selena and the decisions made at a large family council, she went to university and became an art historian. But then came the 90s, and it turned out that all of her intelligent family as completely not adapted to the new times. Someone went abroad to look for muddy shores and their lofts without a trace, someone who went into business and there disappeared notwithstanding the meeting with the roof, someone who Bano betrayed the ideals of his upbringing and drank, lost in a large family apartment ran into when they wanted to exchange it on black realtors. Soon after that Selena's father and mother died in a car crash, and their daughter continued to live. What else was left for her to do? Selena had a chance to earn some casual income, then work with luxury goods in newly created art galleries, and once fate presented a unique opportunity, she traveled to India, where for consultations for a certain Indian millionaire, a great connoisseur of antiquities, received so much money that she was able to return to buy an apartment and in general could live comfortably for several years. But despite her brilliant mind, Selena turned out to be too naive person and became a victim of a man who sang about love sweetly, like a male siren, and then disappeared, together with Selena's money, leaving her in the apartment from which he took out everything valuable and with a secret under her heart. Then Selena heard a rumor that her ex died because he didn't have to brag about his wealth in front of all sorts of murky personalities. However, she didn't care anymore. Now her world centered around her son, John. It was not easy to raise a child without many relatives. Sometimes it seemed to Selena that she could not bear all this weight. She couldn't handle it and, well, maybe she'd just disintegrate into atoms. But somehow she did, because she loved her son. And she wanted a better fate for him than she had for herself. 
As John grew up, he was never denied anything. He could eat cake for breakfast. He had pockets full of imported sweets and a real US-made leather jacket when he was 14. The only thing Selena had tried, as they say, to stand to death on was education. She insisted that John should follow in his family's footsteps and do something great, but he had decided after graduation that he was going to be a manager. Said it was the only thing that was promising today, that he wanted a normal life. Selena sighed, cried over the fact that the business of the whole family name was crumbling, and paid your son's tuition. Selena worked here and there as an art historian, consulted collectors in general spinning. Son graduated from university somehow. And it turned out that no one would offer a manager with no experience a director's chair right away. John worked at a middle position and grumbled about it. Their relationship and the mother-son line was complicated. He blamed her for not being able to get a foothold at the very beginning of life's journey. She reproached him with the fact that he himself is an asshole, pardon my French, but somehow they lived. And then, one day, Selena got sick. She fell on the ice, a blow to the head, hospital. Doctors diagnosed a concussion and at first all the strange things she wrote off to its consequences. But then everything became even worse. Selena lost her balance, dropped objects, she had problems with speech. Doctors waved their hands and prescribed new examinations, for which flew all new astronomical sums from the hard-earned over the years safety cushion. And then the doctor said it was possible to undergo a couple more examinations, but it would be very expensive and if they found something there, you can try to treat, but it would cost millions. Then Selena gave up. She did not have that kind of money. She thought about applying to charitable foundations and they accepted the application. But they said honestly there was little hope because older people are less likely to donate than children because it's very ambiguous. Maybe all the tricks will work, maybe they won't. Then Selena faces the nightmarish truth that she's fading, being made a burden to her son, and she would never have a normal life again, ever, and she hadn't even retired yet, and that made it all the more frustrating. That's why, when John suddenly announced that he had a girlfriend and they want to get married, Selena took it positively. At last, she thought, her son had met a good man, and when she was gone, he wouldn't be alone in the world. At last, Selena hoped it would be easier to live. She believed that her John had met a very good, kind, sweet, proper girl, and at first sight she even liked Elizabeth. Selena has always been a wide-hearted person, without prejudice almost, and so she did not care that Elizabeth came from a remote village where she had a family that drank black, that she could not get into a university or vocational school and live with acquaintances, moonlighting at the market as a saleswoman. Selena reasoned there in every way a person's life can turn and do not need, never need to judge. She had it all worked out the way she wanted it to. The main thing that the soul was pure daughter-in-law, that just was a good person. Oh, how wrong Selena was. Elizabeth liked John very much, because he was a simple guy. And during the time of life in the big city, Elizabeth has already learned to understand men and realized she met a tidbit. Own apartment in the center is one. A position in a large firm is two. Know a lot of relatives, one mother, and that counts disabled. It is three and very promising, by the way. At their wedding, Selena could still walk a little with a walker and even out loud could say a few words and wish the young people happiness. And then, she went down. And then everything began to change. Elizabeth was suddenly unpleasantly surprised that her husband, it turns out, thought that now there is no point in hiring a nurse for his mother because there is she, the wife. Why have a stranger in the house? Elizabeth tried to argue. But John accused her of callousness and they fought so much that she decided to keep quiet and she began to take out her anger on her mother-in-law. Elizabeth hoped she would die soon. But Selena lived. More than a year passed. Elizabeth could not spend a day normally now she grumbled that the smell of drugs had entered her, that she felt like a servant. She increasingly hinted to John that the gynecologist advised her with the birth of her first child not to delay. But to have a child in these conditions is impossible. Systematically and carefully Elizabeth led everything to Selena that Selena should be placed in a specialized institution. Elizabeth was even willing to put up with the fact that it will have to pay for it monthly, but only if there was no hateful mother-in-law. And now, it seems, this time she was closer to success than ever before. During the last few days she had managed to set up several incidents that would prove to John that his mother was completely out of her mind. Thus, Elizabeth pinched her own hand until it was bruised and then, in tears, complained, saying, 
This is what the mad old woman has come to. Understand, we make it worse for her. Elizabeth sighed and squeezed out of herself a new portion of tears. And there she will look after her around the clock, dietary nutrition, again. No, I'm not difficult to cook. Only here, she does not like how I cook. In general, come on already, eh? John frowned and promised to think about everything, but he kept dragging it out. He sent that first it was necessary to deal with everything at work. And then Elizabeth decided to act more decisively herself found a boarding house for the elderly, and she chose one that had not only good reviews, but also the worst. And from morning till night she told her husband, told him. Well, Selena, hissed the sister-in-law, entering the room to the woman. How are you here? And we, you know, have already decided everything about you. What are you hatching, old one? Elizaveta suddenly switched to the first name. We've decided we're going to the orphanage. Yes, yes, why are you mooing? No, you can't refuse. Who will listen to you? Nothing. Enough, you've lived in the world, now you must give to others. Elizabeth froze. Oh, how she wanted to do something. She had never dared to do such a thing before. It seemed to her that with this she would cross a certain line. But now... She realized then there might not be such an opportunity anymore. Elizabeth approached Selena, then brought her palm over her face and lowered it. It was a resounding slap. Wow, her mother-in-law's head flopped back on the pillow. Elizabeth bit her lip, wondering if her husband would hear, but he was rustling in the distant rooms with something. Elizabeth felt strange. She thought it would bring relief, but suddenly she felt ashamed, and that made her even more angry with her mother-in-law. But she changed her mask just in time because John came into the room with a suitcase. Mama, he began timidly, but Elizabeth interrupted him and said that she had explained everything and that Selena felt and understood. Selena was in a strange state. Shock, confusion and disbelief mixed with doom. So this is how it ends for her. Was she to be evicted from her own home and sent to a boarding school to fade away? She had heard read, watched even programs about such a dream, how old people live there will not last long. Although Selena thought doodly, what did it matter to her now? Still is not alive. So maybe it's for the best. There will be no maid of walls around, will not be tormented by memories of normal life. Selena regretted only one thing that she could not tell her son about what kind of wife he has. What a snake this Elizabeth. Selena had no doubt she would leave John as soon as she realized that she had taken everything she could from him. She had a bad feeling in her heart and she would leave him without an apartment. Okay, mom. John sat down on the chair by her bed. He took her fragile hand in his and gave it a gentle squeeze. I'm just saying, we've made up our minds, and I think, if you could talk. Then, mom, do you even understand me? Selena blinked slowly, signaling that she understood. In fact, once upon a time and not too long ago, she had considered talking to her son maybe with a gesture in a barely accessible language. But she also remembered the threats of her daughter-in-law, who had said that if Selena thought to complain, she, knowing the right approaches to John, would convince him that Selena had gone completely mad, that it was like the side effects of medication, that she had lost her mind. Elizabeth went so far as to threaten to make her mother-in-law's life a living hell. Only Elizabeth already felt like she was in hell. How often her consciousness was disturbed, it was difficult for her to return to her memories. The room began to spin before her eyes, then lost its colors and looked like a black and white photograph. Selena could no longer clearly name the cities she had visited while traveling in India and even, to her horror, began to forget what she looked like in the mirror. Perhaps, as Elizabeth had said, she had become an ugly old woman. And yet, right now Selena was feeling very scared. She suddenly realized that indifference to her own fate is like a veil, a fog, and behind it hides a thirst for life. No, she doesn't want to go to the orphanage, she doesn't want to be taken away from home. Because, it would be the end. The woman desperately twitched her arms, she strained with all her might to utter a word, but she realized that in the eyes of her son she looked like a mad invalid, and the daughter-in-law behind his shoulder looking triumphant and grinning. So how are we gonna put her down? John said, he just gotten a message on his phone saying a cab had arrived and he remembered that he'd forgotten to tell them they were taking a seriously ill man. So he had to go and talk to the cabbie, see if he could help him carry his mother downstairs. Well, or he'd have to go to the neighbors with such a request. John sighed, kissed his mother on the cheek, 
told her not to be sad. Everything would be all right and went. John sighed, hissed his mother on the cheek, told her not to be sad. Everything would be all right and went. The weather outside was just fine. The air felt like spring blooming in its dawn. The sun was shining. The rest of the day promised to be marvelous. John sighed again and even heavier his mother was not well at all and it was time for him to stop convincing himself that it was possible to improve. No, he would have to continue living like this. Luckily, he met Elizabeth. She of course is not easy to. But, she is so kind. How many months she followed his mother? Brightened up her leisure Elizabeth said that she read her poems. Now is not the time to get sentimental. The cab's here, where is it? John turned his head, looking for a white car with the right license plates. I think it was parked over there on the opposite side of the yard. The guy headed over there and almost hit a man. Just out of a black jeep parked near their driveway came several men all in black business suits. Seemed like nothing out of the ordinary, right? Except that one glance thrown at them was enough to realize they weren't so simple. The suits were clearly expensive. So is the car. Strong, intense, sensitive guys. And one of them stood out in particular. First of all, he had a red tie. The others had black ties. Secondly, these guys looked European, and this one clearly had jeans from some Eastern country. Dark-skinned, intense black eyes and dark, wavy hair down to the middle of his neck, and in his ear a gold earring with a sparkling stone. I beg your pardon, said the mysterious man as they faced each other, and then delicately but firmly placed his palm on the shoulder of Selena's son. John, I presume? Yes, what do you want? John rounded his eyes. For some reason he remembered that he was late on his loan payment for a brand new smartphone for Lazanka. But no, these guys were too cool for debt collectors. A young man who looked like he was from Iran or India spoke. He introduced himself as Amir Varma and said that he had come to town specifically to meet Selena. Amir expressed regret that the woman, as he had learned, was gravely ill. He also said that this meeting was very important to him, that his father and Selena had once known each other well and he hoped that John would understand, and that he was glad to meet Selena's son, and so on, and so forth. Hey, did you call a cab? The driver pulled John out of his strange, near trance-like state. It costs money to wait a minute. When are you going to get off? Hey, what? Sorry, John said to Selene and the other person he was talking to. One more minute. He turned to Amir again. You see, I won't be able to meet and talk to my mom. She's gotten worse lately. She's not well at all, so I'm moving her today. John swallowed hard, for some reason it was uncomfortable to say it in front of a stranger. I'm moving her to a boarding school. She will be taken care of there. Your mom is under your care, she is not responsible for her actions, squinted the mysterious Amir. What? No, she. In general, she can still think, but not well, I will pay. Then when she gets her pension, everything will be paid from it. Mom is still able-bodied, but she's getting worse then. Joan stopped talking. He didn't understand why he was so frank with Amir. Had he hypnotized him? John turned away and almost spit on the ground from a bad eye. That's it, we've got to go, he said. Except that Amir's fingers did not let him go, digging into his shoulder like the paw of a predatory beast. And yet smile flawlessly, Hollywood simple Amir. I really need to talk to your mom. I think we have a little time. Kindly, he handed the cab driver who was dumbfounded a few thousand for your weight, and this he held out much more money to John, for disrupting your plans. You're a businessman, John, aren't you? I'm sure we can understand each other. Believe me, I really, really need to talk to your mom. John's mouth dropped open. He's just been handed three months' worth of money. Wow. And that's what, like a bribe to keep him from interfering with the meeting. John sniffled as he struggled with pride and lust for easy money, and a little bit of fear, the nature of which he could not understand. Well, all right, he said at last, tucking the wad of money into his pocket, let me walk you up. They went to the entrance. John was a little surprised that there were two other people walking along with Amir. Is he really such an important bird that he walks around with guards like a millionaire from a movie? It's dirty here, John muttered for some reason, because the cleaning lady had taken a sick leave. Well, what took you so long? She's at it again. Elizabeth opened the door, angry. And who is this? Rounded her eyes at the visitors who were already squeezing into the hallway, as if to his home. Mama's acquaintance. What? 
an acquaintance of hers, I said, Elizabeth. John took his wife by the elbow and pulled her aside. He's got to meet her for some reason. I've never seen him before in my life. But he. And then John showed his wife the money. He was willing to pay me to let him in. Elizabeth froze as if a wind-up doll had frozen and the gears were turning in his head. Could it be fake? I don't think so, John replied. I think. I don't know what it is. But I was eager to talk to her. She's crazy. And an invalid, a vegetable. Elizabeth panted with displeasure. The last word about his mother cut John unpleasantly. He looked into the room Amir was sitting on a chair next to Selena's bed and talking to her about something, or rather, considering that Selena was unable to speak, he was telling her something. Another man, what the hell is that? The second man, a skinny blonde man, whose face and movements evoked involuntary associations with a lean greyhound dog, was probing Selena's arm for some reason, as if checking her pulse, and he was briefly, business-like informing Amir. And then John caught his mother's gaze, so meaningful, she blinked. Mom? He rushed into the room. Mom, do you realize what you're being told? Selena froze, the look of her eyes filled with tears, wandered between the mysterious guests' aliens, her son and still jumped to her daughter-in-law, who was also not going to stay away Elizabeth was eerily curious about what was going on here. Plus, it is the same happening for some reason she did not like. Amir spoke to Selena again, patiently. She opened her mouth, trying to say something. And who are you? Elizabeth spoke up. This is, you know, my mother-in-law, and I want to know by what right. Amir turned to the Selenian type that resembled a ruthless hunting dog. He nodded, smiled, and all the following events happened very quickly. First of all, Amir suddenly picked Selena up in his arms easily, like a fluff ball, and very gently. Her head was on his shoulder. On the gaunt body of the woman, the old dress was hanging like on a hanger. What are you doing? John started, but then he realized that this unpleasant type of dog was behind his back, and the next moment something sharp stabbed into his neck. His consciousness, his perception of the world around him at the same moment as a shroud, he realized that he was injected with a shot. He wanted to scream, he wanted to fight, to resist. But he also realized that his wife had done the same thing to Elizabeth, just clamped her mouth shut, injected something into her neck, held her like that for a couple of minutes. And then, John suddenly realized that she, like him, looked like a very sleepy or rather drunk person who was being supported by a kind friend so that he wouldn't fall. John wanted to scream but was numb. He could only sluggishly move his arms and legs. He stepped where he was directed, third floor. The way down was very, very fast. John prayed to the universe that they would meet someone along the way someone who could realize that something evil was going on. But alas, they went down without seeing anyone. And then, just as easily and casually, the whole trio was stuffed into the cars. Yes, John now realized that Amir had two cars, but the second jeep was parked in the distance. And the cab, by the way, was not visible at all. Gone. John, sitting more and more softly, a helpless puppet in the back seat, glanced at Elizabeth, his wife, so gentle, so defenseless in her robe, she was sound asleep. And no matter how much John resisted it, he too fell into sleep. He woke up with an unpleasant headache, dry mouth, nausea, and his limbs felt like cotton. John struggled, cried out, wheezed, and fell off the bed. He sat down on the floor and twisted his head around. Elizabeth? His wife was sitting in a cushioned armchair with her knees drawn up to her chest and her arms wrapped around them. She looked at her husband with a frown. Dear morning, Nashol. What? Elizabeth. I'm not. We've been kidnapped. You were. How did you know? Elizabeth, sweetheart. John staggered up to her, bent down and hugged her, wrapping his arms around her tightly. It's all right. It's going to be all right. We're going to be rescued. Uh-huh. You slept six hours longer than me. Yes. Why? Elizabeth. Did they do anything to you? No. Calm down. The girl shoved him away from her and John, not trusting his own body yet and stepping away, plopped down on the edge of the bed. He looked around. It was as if they were in an ordinary room, ordinary furnishings. But the window. There was no window. Two doors. One leads to the bathroom, the other an exit, but locked in armed guards, as if reading his mind, Elizabeth explained. No, I don't have a phone to call for help, she added and sniffed. 
What do they want? John asked. Personally, he didn't have a single clue. Nothing was clear at all. A strange man, a foreigner if you could tell by his accent, demanded to see his mother, and then they were all kidnapped. Mom. John remembered her just now and said it out loud. I don't know, Elizabeth said. He says he'll take care of her. He says he has options for her treatment. So what do they want? John rubbed the injection site in his neck. There was a slight nagging sensation. Ransom? From what? From your paycheck? Or do you think they'll offer to sell the seller to us and we'll get millions for it? Are you even listening to me? What ransom? They wanted your mother. I'm scared, John said after the room had been silent for a while. Maybe they're maniacs. No. Amir is not a maniac. He's just crazy, replied Elizabeth. He needs us, has a guarantee. What are you talking about? John was used to being patient with his wife. In their couple in general, it was Elizabeth who usually initiated all conflicts, and he put them out because otherwise it was more expensive. But right now John was beginning to boil. It seemed to him that his wife was much better informed about everything that was going on than he was, and it pissed him off. And why did I get involved with you? Elizabeth sighed. I thought still from an intelligent family, an apartment in the center, good upbringing, not booze, will not cheat. And I thought you just fell in love with me. It was hardly the right time to find out about the relationship. In fact, it wasn't the right time at all. But John was on a roll. What are you doing? You married me on purpose? Would you leave me alone? Elizabeth snapped at him. Can we talk about your mother's involvement with the mafia? What? John's jaw dropped. What mob? He could picture his mom in many different roles. The landlady who could bake a dozen layers of dumplings. A tour guide. Mesmerizing tourists. A strict teacher. But, Mafia? Anybody but his mom. And even more so. Why would the Mafia need her now that she was basically one foot in the grave? Finally, Elizabeth spoke, and following her words with his imagination, John was quite clear on the whole picture. Elizabeth was the first to come to her senses. She fought, she even tried to bite. She was threatened that the sedative injection could be given again, and was told to listen. Amir ceremoniously, and for some reason it seemed particularly offensive, apologized for the inconvenience and for the fact that temporarily Elizabeth will have to fall out of her normal life. Elizabeth, whose hint began to vividly pop up all sorts of stories about maniacs with basements, has to clarify. Then he said that he was the son of an old friend of Selena's. Friends, explained Elizabeth, are you aware that you have committed a crime? Amber said with a chuckle that Elizabeth already likes him, he he said likes the perky. You were flirting with him. John would have jumped up and shaken his wife like a ripe peer if he had more strength. Elizabeth ignored his question and continued the story. Amir said that he needed Celine for one thing, but he also needs guarantees of her loyalty and devotion. And what could be better guarantees than having the people close to the person whose help you want to get? Elizabeth made an assumption, so they're sort of hostages in case Selena doesn't help. Amir asked her not to jump to conclusions, and then he pretended to be offended and suggested replacing the term hostages with special guests, and added that even in the Middle Ages there was an interesting practice when someone from the royal family was sent to the court of the ruler with whom they had an alliance, in order to provide guarantees of loyalty. So he said that something similar was happening to them. This Amir is also a historian. Elizabeth sniffed again, and John realized that his wife is more of a flirt, but in fact she is scared very much. So what's next? Are we going to sit here and live how? Mumbled John. He's crazy. He is crazy. He said he'd explain the details later. In the meantime, the lock clicked on the door. John craned his neck. A guard appeared on the threshold with a tray in his hands. Behind his back was another guard, a closet barely taller and wider than the doorway. So any thoughts of a determined resistance fell away by themselves. The guard said something in English, walked over and put the tray on the table, then left and the door closed. What did he say? Do you speak a foreign language? John asked. I learned, I'd often went to my neighbor and she hid me from my parents when they were catching squirrels. She was an English teacher and she also studied with me, Elizabeth answered, then came to the table and began to remove the lids from the dishes. We have food delivered from restaurants, she said, and nodded at the pile of menus on the table. Pick what you want. Meals as many times a day as you want. There's everything you need in the bathroom. 
Tomorrow, they promise to take you out for a walk to start. This is some mansion, she added. Are you gonna eat? I don't want to. John shouted. I'm going on a hunger strike. Until they let me go. Oh, you should, Elizabeth grinned. With bandits, you know, it is better to be careful. Especially, they have a doctor. And what? Well, prescribe you tranquilizers to be obedient. Oh, come on. I'm just kidding. Just think, maybe you shouldn't do that. What's the point of starving yourself if you can eat? And then, well, yes, your mother. Your mother? Elizabeth corrected herself, softening her tone. She's done something. We're hostages. But she, anyway, it could still be okay. How do you know? Maybe we'll all be buried in the woods. I don't think so. Why not? Well, we were kidnapped in broad daylight. Theoretically, of course, it's really not neat. But somehow I think Amir. He's not that bad of a man. He's trying to be polite. It's just, uh, it's an involuntary measure. I mean, we wouldn't have gone voluntarily. John really didn't like the way his wife was talking. Her attitude of submissive victimhood. And what she said about this Amir. I know what's wrong with you. He blurted out insultingly. You've developed Stockholm Syndrome. What? Elizabeth doesn't understand. This is when the victim begins to understand his captor and sympathize with him. Maybe even fall in love. Are you completely stupid? No. Only I don't understand. My mom's not at all. So why did they need her? There's no cure for something like her. Well, we definitely have time to think. Elizabeth grinned unhappily. Let's eat. What is there? I've ordered all sorts of things, his wife muttered in a strange tone. You don't take me to restaurants. Shrimp here, dessert with mango. John sighed and decided to eat too. Starving was really stupid. And he was also starting to think that, eh, he could only get out of this mess. He would start a new life. He would go in for sports. He would self-develop. He would live to love and appreciate every day. Just to get out and also to understand what mom could have gotten into, and how to help her now. Yes, he was ready to send her to boarding school, because he and his young wife need to live, but what was happening now, it was already beyond. There was a clock in the room, by the way, so John and Elizabeth were not completely disconnected from reality in terms of determining the time. The next day in the morning, the same guard came in and in addition to breakfast, he also handed over several bags, which contained clothes. Okay. The most necessary dress, jeans, t-shirts, jackets. Yep, like room dogs are provided, commented John gloomily on the delivery. What the hell is this? Well, while you were asleep, I told you that we cannot sit here like this. You were still in your clothes in the usual, and I was not going to this stupid boarding school, so I was in a row. Or would you prefer that I stayed in it? Elizabeth squinted. So it lasted two more days. In the room, by the way, there was also still a TV, so there was at least some way not to wallow in their own unhappy thoughts. The same guard kept telling me that John's mom was doing well, that she was getting the help she needed, and always apologized to the chief, Amir, for the inconvenience. You know, they should be looking for us. John said one day. Let's say that I went on a short vacation at work at my own expense, because here, I wanted to arrange my mother and do it not in a hurry, but, but, and our acquaintances, friends, They'll be looking for us. They'll probably think something's happened to us. I think that a man like Amir calculated everything a hundred steps ahead, said Elizabeth and scratched the tip of his nose thoughtfully looked at John. By the way, if he decides to kill us, what will be your last wish? His wife's strange and creepy question took him by surprise. John just opened his mouth. Fool, he said to his wife and turned away. He didn't want to think about bad things. In general, it was like there was no telling how this story would end. But to think about bad things, he didn't want to and couldn't. The door opened, and this time it wasn't the guard behind it. It was Amir himself, still as exquisitely polite, and that made him even more sinister. I'm afraid my dear guests are tired from the long wait, he said, and John cringed at the pretentiousness and unnaturalness of the phrase. Bless your guests, he replied, wondering how many times he could punch Amir's thin long nose before the guards would have him rounded up. I suppose you wish to see your mother, Amir ignored his barb. She's feeling much better and would like to see you too. Both of you, she has something to tell you. And then John jumped up. Yes, I want to see her. And if you've laid a finger on her. Actually, 
The master of the position raised an eyebrow in feigned surprise. I am currently her only friend and her only hope. No, don't worry. Celine is perfectly fine. So, shall we go? When the man entered the room, Selena couldn't believe her eyes. She even thought she had lost her mind. Rightly so, in her situation, insanity would probably be a merciful relief from the burden of realizing how one could turn into a helpless person and be betrayed by one's own confused child. However, it was not a vision. The man coming to her was real. At first she thought it was him. But then she realized the resemblance was uncannily strong, but not absolute. Her father on the other hand, Selena knew him she would never forget, her nightmare and her her curse. It happened when she went to India. It was supposed to be an individual consultation regarding a single collection of antiquities. That's how it had been framed in the beginning. That's how Selena's acquaintances thought of it. But she herself soon realized she was in trouble. His name was Ajit Varma and he came from an ancient family. He was a millionaire of the old generation. His ancestor, who, by the way, came from a caste not the most elite level, in the era when India was ruled by Great Britain, cleverly managed to make a fortune, trading in valuables that interested sophisticated connoisseurs from England. And also, according to legend, this ancestor was related to a certain caste of priests of a forbidden cult known for its monstrous cruelty and the practice of what could be called black magic. Those priests believed that they served not the deities of heaven, but the creatures of the underworld, evil spirits who incarnated as half-human and half-reptilian. Mr. Ajit Varma accepted Selena as a dear guest. He arranged her a tour of his possessions and over the name Fee in advance flooded with gifts. He was gallant, radiated power, and charming. And then, from what Selena understood, she was to work not with ordinary antiques, but with things. In general, she realized the speech is not about science, but about some adventure with a mystical tinge. In any case, Mr. Varman himself believed in the mystical overtones of this project. And that's when she got scared. Selena did not want to work for a madman who behaved like a sectarian. But Mr. Varma did not allow her to refuse. He threatened her and offered her a reward. He said she wasn't required to do much criminal work, just expert advice. What was Selene to do? Only obey. And she plunged into her work. Ancient tablets, writing on stones, scrolls ready to fall apart in her fingers. Gradually, everything was coming together. Ajit Varma was looking for something. He was looking for something related to Selene's dead cult. Selene was even more afraid because she knew so much now. But then the unexpected happened. Ajit Varma was arrested, presumably because he had bought some of his artifact collection on the black market and had ordered the theft of items from a number of museums. And Selena managed to slip out of the country under the radar. And although she didn't think it was quite right, but she accepted the money that was given to her by the helpers of the captured millionaire for services already rendered. Selena returned home. And that's when she saw him Amir, Ajit's son, and as he told one beautiful model from Vladivostok. The boy's mother, unfortunately, died in childbirth. His body was weakened by the unusual climate and some local infection. Ajit decided to teach his son in her native language as well. Amir seemed to Selena to be a very smart and enthusiastic boy who sometimes came to her study. It seemed that his father did not hide his studies from him. Selene and Amir even became friends. One time he said that he would definitely find the Cobra Emperor's cursed city. Selena knew it was such a fairy tale. About an underground city made of pure gold. And now there was a man from her past. And he immediately, as they called it, took off at a gallop. Amir said that he knew how seriously ill Selena was. And he can help her. He has money connections with the right clinics, and the best specialists. He will give her a life without pain and suffering. If she helps him finish what his father once started, Selena thought she was dreaming, in which nightmare and sweet dreams of a happy life were intertwined in a bizarre way. Just think of it. Five minutes ago, her own son was packing her suitcase for a boarding school, where she would slowly fade away in the company of similarly outcast invalids and old people, and her daughter-in-law was smirking triumphantly. And now the son of the man she had once feared more than anything else in the world was reaching out to her. If he had said he was Hayes and offered to sell his soul to Selene, she would have accepted without hesitation. And then, she dozed off in his arms and was given some sort of remedy. She woke up in her room. She realized it wasn't a real clinic, but a room in a mansion. The doctor with her was the same blonde man. He explained that for a few days she would be receiving an experimental drug 
that would restore brain function and strengthen her body enough for her to tolerate air travel well. Selena will then be in a private clinic in India for about a month. As her doctor has assured her, her disease is quite treatable. Just cost it will be a few million dollars, but it is such a trifle, nothing is a pity for such a valuable specialist. Amir, by the way, apologized for having to bring Selena's son and daughter-in-law with him. He calmly explained that it was his guarantee. In general, Selena didn't quite understand and how she could be a danger to this man's plans in her condition, even if they did cure her. But she also remembered Amir's father and realized his son had gone into him. The same methods, in fact. And yet, Selena wasn't willing to go to such a length, risking herself for the sake of her health. Why not? But to involve her son in all this. Mom? John was shocked when he saw her. Selena was sitting in a chair. Before, she could only lie down. She smiled at him and said, Hello, son. The doctor said that it would take a very complicated and expensive treatment to make her even a little bit mobile and here. When Selena stood up and opened her arms to him, saying, Well, can you hug your mother? He didn't know what to say. But how is it possible? A question came out of his mouth. What have they done? It's just getting started, son, Selena sighed. Mom, are you? Are you healthy? Agged Elizabeth. She too was amazed at the change with her mother-in-law, but she couldn't be so happy about it. In fact, she was afraid that right now Selena would open her mouth and tell her son how her daughter-in-law treated her. It seemed to Elizabeth that then she would fall into the ground. John would never forgive her for that. But for some reason, Selena only looked at her strangely and no revelation followed. Instead, she talked about something else. Selena explained to her family what was going on. She omitted the part that might have talked about what her first Indian employer was actually looking for. All she said was that she had worked with a very passionate, enthusiastic collector at the time, and added firmly that that was all John needed to know, and went on to say that Amir was that man's son and he needed her help. She also explained that the reward would be great her treatment. So you mean to say that you didn't find any more specialist in the world? Elizabeth squinted incredulously. If he's so tough, he could have hired a whole institute. That's true, Selena nodded, but the thing is that the subject of the research, these are very narrow issues. Not many scientists in the world have dealt with them. And then, some of the subjects I've worked with, Selena explained cautiously, she was afraid of blabbing too much. Some of those items are already lost, but I remember everything and I can, how should I put it? Oh, it's hard to explain. Anyway, the thing is also that the other scientists, well, probably won't want to work privately fearing for their reputation. Mom, John squinted. Is this something criminal? Selena shrugged. She decided to ignore the question because she didn't know how legitimate Amir's business was. And anyway, Selena thought, I'm just a scientist. What do I care about this? It's his problem, not mine. And my problem is, survive. It's just that in science, there are some uncomfortable questions. If you touch them, then consider that all deserve the reputation of a weirdo. And what do I have to be afraid of? Mom, but you're. What if all this treatment? Well, it's not officially confirmed anywhere, right? What if something happens to you? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not letting you go. Son, Celine grinned and reached out to him, squeezed and unclenched his fingers. Then she took a piece of paper and a pen and wrote her name and signed it. Look at me, son. I can walk. I can talk. I can be a normal, functioning human being and all this for a few shots. I don't care what was in there. Yes, I'm a little scared, but what's the alternative? Give up, go back to being the way I was and have you take me to boarding school. John averted his eyes. Now that his mother was as she had been, he felt so ashamed. In general it seemed, then acted as not himself as if under hypnosis, and at the same time there was a soulful understanding himself. Himself then decided that the mother is a sick burden for the life of a young family. I am capable, fortunately, Selena added, and I'll go. Maybe, this is the last adventure of my life. But you, I know Amir wants you to be a guarantee that I'll do everything the right way. But, and now Selena turned to Amir, who had been present in the room the whole time. Yes, I want to live, you can't even imagine how. But uh, I'll fly alone. Just me, I know you're your father's son. He didn't trust anyone either. But here I'll be all yours and my son and daughter-in-law. 
you'll let them go. Otherwise, I'll refuse. There was silence in the room. John was shocked again by his mom. She's willing to give up the chance to be cured, just so. Just so she doesn't set him up. And this after what he was so ready to do, to shove her into boarding school, just to avoid complicating his life. Finally, Amir nodded. All right, they can leave. They'll be released as soon as we leave. And I hope they'll be reasonable and won't uh, claim, for example, that I kidnapped them. We'll forget about this little misunderstanding, won't we? Amir smiled, and I, by the way, am ready to compensate for the inconvenience caused. You think you can buy everything, don't you? John thought that it was impossible to insult him more than everything that had already happened, but it turned out that you can. I agree. Elizabeth cut in. Can I have cash? Elizabeth. John could hardly breathe. What the hell is going on? One moment and he stood beside his mother, resolutely took her under his arm. This is how it's going to be. I'm going with my mom, not as your hostage. But I want to know she's okay. I don't trust you. That's why I'm going to be there for you. John, why? Elizabeth wrung her hands nervously. What are you talking about? Let's just take the money and... I didn't think you were so interested in them. He looked at his wife unkindly. Well, I'm so just... Why do you need to fly somewhere? Pouted the girl, and then suddenly said, All right, then I'll fly too. I'm not going to let my husband go somewhere alone. No, but she added, looking at Amir. Then the amount of compensation, of course, will have to be reconsidered. Good, Amir said. In that case, we can leave the day after tomorrow morning. How? John was ready, but not so fast. And we'll need more. I did some checking, Amir squinted slyly. You and your wife have passports, you flew to Turkey on vacation. Selena has one too, you have it in case you manage to raise money for treatment abroad through some fund. So there's nothing holding you back. What about work? John exclaimed, I have to take time off work, I can't do that. Just call, said Amir. And believe me, I can really take care of the reward, after which you won't have to hold on to this job so much. You'll find a new one. John wanted to say that he didn't need the handouts of a crazy millionaire, or maybe even a billionaire, but then spin on everything mentally, of course, and decided that now the safety of his mom was most important. Amir, that is called, let go of the leash after a serious conversation with all three future participants of the adventure, he let John and Elizabeth go home. John said that he and his wife, excuse me, but needed to do some proper packing. John didn't know what his wife was thinking, and how much money had clouded her brain in a flash, but he himself was somewhat dreading what was coming and was going over in his mind the options of how to change everything or cancel it altogether. But none of the options existed. Okay, just someone demanded blackmailed, but he was convinced that it turns out that there was a drug that could help his mother, and that was the most important thing. John went to work and there, afraid to look the boss in the eye, said say for family reasons, but he needs to urgently go on vacation at his own expense. Not time off, but a long vacation. Is it connected with your mother? The chief asked sympathetically. Yes. John blurted out, grasping the lifeline. You see, there is one treatment option and need to accompany. In that case, I can only agree, not at the chief. Family is the greatest value in the life of any person. Good health to your mom. But with acquaintances and relatives, everything was not so simple. They poured questions about what kind of treatment, where, how much, who will treat, and so on. John first tried to lie, say, found a clinic, just go. But he was asked more persistently, and whether he did not take a loan against the security of the apartment for this case, and whether it is safe, and so on. John realized he was walking on a thin line, so in the end he decided to seem a little rude, but to say so sorry, but this is our family business and I, say, do not want to discuss the nuance until everything is clear. Yes, superstitious a little and in general, it is already a lot of stress, and you I do not ask for money for this treatment, so please, leave me alone. In the end, John had a straight fight with half of his relatives. The other half sympathetically wished him luck, in general, everything was solved. Where are you going? John asked his wife, who was getting dressed in the hallway. We're flying out tomorrow, Elizabeth replied, the shopping center is still working, I'll have time. Have time for what? To buy this windsuit, she looked at him like a fool. And a new beach towel. What? John couldn't figure out what she was talking about. What's windsuit? What, 
Are you going to a resort? Amir said we'll be on the coast, Elizabeth shrugged. So there is a beach. Or do you think I should stay locked up? No, honey. You marinated me for how long? Saying that here with my mother out the side and go on vacation. I don't want to miss this chance. Okay, bye. And she ran off. John sat in the kitchen until she came back, just staring at a point on the wall. He was in a mood, a bit of a mood. And then, the next day, when they got to the airport, it got even worse. Because it's one thing to have a theoretical event and quite another to have a practical one. When they're walking towards an airplane, a private plane, by the way. Next to your mom, your wife, this suspicious rich guy, his security detail, which in fact, a little more and the bandits, because they so easily went naturally to kidnap people, holding them hostage. And this doctor, in general, everything that was going on reminded John of the plot of some Hollywood blockbuster, and in the course of the case, it was clearly not a comedy, but a thriller, and I wanted to believe with a happy ending. Finally, we went up to the airplane. We sat down and fastened our seatbelts. The plane took off. The earth was disappearing below. The city became so small. John fidgeted and scratched nervously at the back of his head. What a mess. They flew far away, but with one landing somewhere in Central Asia. Hey, wake up. Elizabeth shook him on the shoulder. We are in India. How happy we are. John replied snidely. During the flight, they were offered food and drinks but for some reason he could only pour black coffee into himself, and now it made itself felt thirsty and pain in the stomach. When he got off the plane it didn't get any better. It was hot, humid air, and the sun was blazing so hot that it felt like we were in the Sahara. John wrinkled his nose, of course. Could they have been greeted by anything other than a limousine motorcade surrounded by SUVs? What's Elizabeth what? There she is, happy, jumping and, in general, John suddenly noted that his wife now smiles at his mother much more often than before. Probably happy that she recovered, he thought. The motorcade raced along the free road, then along the road not free. John was finally distracted from his unhappy thoughts and stuck to the window. What was there outside the window? There was a cow walking down the street, a hundred people on a truck. Finally, we entered the territory, as he realized of a clinic. It was clean. The staff was almost all European. A few people, mostly old people, were strolling in a gorgeous flower and garden, resting. Fountains, rose bushes, melodious music playing in the background. Amir explained that this was the clinic where Selena would be spending the next few weeks. John was tense about leaving his mother alone. They were escorted into the office. The director of the clinic was a German named Dietrich. He smiled a lot and assured that there was nothing to worry about. They have the latest technology here. They brought some papers. John realized the contracts, and the copies were also in English. Dietrich, by the way, was naturally aware that Amir was paying for everything. He also invited an interpreter for comfortable communication. Thank you, son, said Selena, when it was time to part now John and Elizabeth had to, as Amir said, leave the clinic. But it was possible to visit Selena every day. Why? He was confused. It's me. It's me who should apologize. I rushed. I rushed with the decision about the boarding school. For deciding to come with me, said Selena. Of course, you don't decide anything and you can't help in anything, but I'm grateful to you. And about the past, let's not talk about it now, okay? We have to take care of the future. And also, son, please be careful with Elizabeth. What are you talking about, mom? Nothing. Well, don't listen to the old one. Selena grinned. Toward evening, it got dark early and frighteningly fast, left the clinic. Amir announced that the dear guests, well, that is, prisoners of another status for themselves, in fact, John did not recognize, will stay all this time at his villa, and then when Selena will recover, get strong enough. Well, from the intricate, intricately woven speeches of Amir, John understood that later she will do some scientific work, which will take some time. But what that work would be, Amir wouldn't say and John knew he was keeping it quiet on purpose. The guy could have sworn on anything that a lot of things were not what they seemed. Previously, when John watched movies and TV series, he quietly admired the lifestyle of millionaires all these mansions, and now he himself found himself in such a place. The villa occupied a vast area and was surrounded by a garden with orange and pomegranate trees. There were peacocks walking here and, to the guy's horror, there were several cheetahs in a huge enclosure. Amir, Noticing his reaction, 
grinned and said that you should not be afraid. Because firstly, cheetahs do not walk freely wherever they want, and secondly, in the wild there is not a single case of their attack on humans. But for some reason Amir added proudly that in the past cheetahs were domesticated to be used in hunting, because with their speed no living creature can escape from them. They were used in hunting, on animals, or runaway slaves. Hearing the latter, John made a note to himself that Amir had maniacal tendencies. He and Elizabeth were placed in luxurious, simply royal chambers, a bedroom, two living rooms, a garden, two bathrooms, and a dressing room. He appreciated the luxury, hummed, and as he was in shoes, plumped on the sofa. What are we going to do here? I'll die of boredom. You're so boring. Elizabeth was already unpacking. You don't know how to accept the gifts of fate. In this case, it's got a grin and claws. Listen, why are you so happy? I thought I married a sensible girl. Why should I be nervous? Amir is a very respectable and polite man. He must be the head of the local mafia. Nonsense. Amir offered the guests the option to eat in their rooms or come to one of the three dining rooms of the mansion will set anywhere. He too could sometimes keep them company at dinner or lunch, but alas not often because he had so much to do. Formerly, when his days were subjected to the usual schedule of a modern successful city man and manager, John could only dream of doing nothing. Now, he didn't know where to put himself. Yes, you could lie around and watch TV movies shows. You could go swimming in the pool. There was also a tennis court, a stable, and even a boxing gym, but all this did not interest him. The essence of his days was to visit his mother, to find out from her how she was feeling. How was the treatment going? John did not understand anything from her words, nor from Richard's explanations. It was all very complicated. Then he realized that it was still possible to walk around the city a little. Yes, accompanied by guards, but that was something. But communication with his own wife became worse than ever. It seemed that they bored each other as much as they did not bore each other even when they simultaneously went on sick leave with flu for three weeks. Or was it more Elizabeth? She slept until lunchtime, then ate, mostly sweets and fruit. Then she'd go to the beach, which wasn't far away. She hardly ever went to the clinic to see her mother-in-law, who said she was sick of hospital smells. But she went into town often, and mostly for shopping. John was almost ashamed when he realized that Elizabeth had gone to Amir to ask for money. She asked him for money under the pretext that he had promised them compensation and so on. John shouted at Elizabeth and she, she threw a vase at him. The vase crashed over his head. He dodged it and it hit the wall and shattered. You got me into this. If it wasn't for you, and now you don't like that I'm just trying to survive. That night Elizabeth said she would like to have dinner with Amir and ask him about local life, just for fun. John wished her a pleasant evening through his teeth. He didn't recognize his wife at all. Though, something, he realized, had slipped into Elizabeth before. He just didn't want to notice it. So passed about two weeks, and then Dr. Richter said that it turns out that there is no need for surgery. It turned out that modern technology, something to do with ultrasound allows you to affect some parts of the brain so that Selena's problem can be solved literally in one session, one procedure. But this was again an experimental treatment, on equipment that was not officially authorized to be used yet, in fact, but Selena decided to take a risk. She kept saying, what did she have to lose? Better a risk than a return to that state. On the day the procedure was scheduled, John couldn't find a place to go. Elizabeth had run to the beach in the morning. She was there taking surfing lessons from some coach from Australia. But John didn't even have the energy for jealousy. He was just trying to figure out where he had miscalculated so badly that he had even married this woman. He had bought the fact that Elizabeth was not like modern city girls, knave, believing in miracles, defenseless, a dream for someone who wants to feel a strong man, a patron, except that the dream has a dark side. In such disheveled feelings John walked through the palace. Yes, this mansion could be called a palace. He was walking, and then suddenly around a corner he ran into a girl. The girl gasped and dropped a stack of books from her hands, they scattered on the floor. I'm sorry, I'll help you now. He said, sitting down and immediately, having realized, frantically tried to remember how to say it in English. It turned out not very well. It's all right, I wasn't looking where I was going. Answered the girl and John rounded his eyes because she spoke with almost no accent. She looked at him carefully too. Aha, she said and smiled broadly. So that's who he's hiding. I beg your pardon? John didn't understand. 
I'm saying that's who my brother is hiding. And who is your brother? Amir, the girl said and bit her lip, wandering a curious look at John. She looked no more than 18, 19 years old. Her skin was dark, almost Indian, but her hair was light brown with a reddish tint, curled in large curls and flowing down to her waist. Her eyes were large and light brown with amber-yellow sparks. She was dressed simply in black tight pants, white blouse, and the only jewelry was a gold chain with a pearl. I didn't know he had a sister, John swallowed nervously. And I didn't know a professor from Cambridge would be so young. Professor? From Cambridge? John rounded his eyes. But I'm not. Not a professor. The girl squinted. Hmm? Who it is then? As far as I know, it was a scientist from Great Britain who was supposed to be a guest in this wing of the mansion. And you don't seem to be him at all. John and I were just blabbering about being the guest here. And I'm waiting for my mom to heal. And then she'll do something as a historian. Well, Amir Slay. Grinned the girl. Oh, someone's coming. She grabbed John by the elbow and dragged him away with a force unexpected for a young, fragile person. They fell into a dark room, closed the door and froze. Very close. So close that John could feel the warmth of her body and her breath tickled his neck. Shall we talk? She asked, and he found it so exciting that hot goosebumps danced down his spine. Let's talk. He agreed and thought that with that voice, she could talk about anything with him. The girl reached for the wall, knocked with a swish of her hand and flicked on the light. John blinked and they found themselves in the library. The walls were all covered with books up to the ceiling and there were shelves, a few tables, comfortable chairs, and not a soul. Grandfather was a bibliophile, smiled Amir's unexpected sister. Oh, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Marion, and she extended her hand to him. John, he shook the fragile palm, and the goosebumps on his back danced repeatedly. Shall we sit down? She asked and beckoned him behind her to one of the leather couches. John, of course, was all for it. It turned out that Marianne was Amir's free-spirited sister. His father was the nature of passionate, and after the death of his mother Amir quickly found her replacement also a model, a beauty from Eastern Europe. But this second choice did not give up everything for love, she stayed to live in Italy and raised her daughter there, only sometimes letting her go to visit her father. Marion's mother now held an advertising agency, and Marion worked in tourism, and so came to visit her brother. He was like her father in his time very busy. True, what is busy did not say exactly. Wake the way, say, he is now visiting historians, professors, studying the collection of antiques father. In general, I was not supposed to walk in this part of the house, Charmingly sniffed Marianne's nose and looked so slyly that John guessed this girl is not bred to feed, but to give to break the rules, she is a pain. And what do I find? A mysterious visitor. Not even a professor. And with mom. Will you tell me what's going on here? John thought. What are the options? He didn't like Amir. He was helping Selena only for his own strange game, but he had a sister and for some reason he wanted to believe her at first sight. There wasn't a soul around to trust, or was there now? Finally, having made up his mind, John laid out everything he knew from the beginning, began the story and ended with what had happened in his life in recent days. Marion listened very carefully. You must know something, she began carefully. I have something to tell you. And what was that? Her tone suggested she had something unpleasant to say. John wished he hadn't been hanging around the mansion in the first place. He would have been sitting quietly and peacefully now, going to visit his mother in the evening. He realized it wasn't too late to get up, say goodbye and leave. After all, Amir had brought them here. He's paying for Selena's treatment. He's the boss of everything. As hard as it is to admit, who is this girl? She introduced herself as his sister. However, John didn't move. Instead, he listened and Marianne spoke. She told him that her father, unfortunately, had mental problems. Yes, he was a big businessman, a successful man. This was not known to almost everyone around him, only the closest people. And the family doctor said that this disorder can be especially affected by such an excessive fascination with mystical legends, the search for something that does not exist as if. In general, for Mr. Ajit Varma were dangerous obsessions. Only who could stop him? After Selena left, he ended up going insane. He ended up in a private psychiatric hospital. 
he was possessed by a fear of being chased by monsters half snake and half man. When I was little, I wanted to live here, Marion said with a smile and sadness in her strikingly beautiful eyes, but my mom was against it. Marion admitted that they didn't see her brother that often, but she knows him well enough to say that in many ways, he is very much like his father. In both the best and the worst ways. And then she added that she shouldn't actually say this, but she feels that Amir is in the same danger as her father. John had been in shock so often lately that the next batch of reasons to be in that state didn't really affect him. He'd only noted to himself that his family seemed to be in deeper trouble than they had seen before. Amir didn't seem crazy. But if Marianne was right then, who knows how things might turn out. John only hoped that Marianne might be exaggerating out of fear or for some other personal reason. I can help, the beauty said. If you keep me informed of what's going on, and it's possible we'll see each other occasionally, I think I can help. How? John asked. I don't know yet, she smiled. But I think we should be a team now. You and me. She finished, and John, though he had no intention of doing so, believed her completely. In fact, Elizabeth should not be included in this team. She only had money on her mind and she didn't look like her old self. And my mother should not be included. She was too dependent on Amir and would probably be overly grateful to him for the treatment. So that left only him John, the only man in the family. No one else, in fact, to take care of his relatives. He agreed. And he and Marianne agreed where to meet furtively next time and then she left the office turned out to be full of secret doors, and he returned to the main corridor and went where he went to look at the peacock chicks. And then, after a while, came the news from the clinic. All the procedures, all the treatment had been carried out, completed successfully. The doctors, after a concilium, said for sure Salima is healthy, but they gave recommendations to exclude excessive physical and psycho-emotional stress, as it can worsen the condition and just to strengthen the body. Selena moved from the clinic to Umber's mansion. John was overjoyed. Elizabeth, well, she was unhappy about something again. And then one day, John suddenly found his mother at her desk, piled with books. She looked sleepy, tired. He asked her, you have to work so hard. She replied that it was all right. Another time he witnessed Amir persistently, even harshly, telling Celine that they didn't have much time, they needed to hurry up. In general, do not care. Judging by his behavior, Amir wanted to the recommendations of doctors, he was rushing to his goal. And when John tried to tell him, say, this is not the case, that millionaire yelled at him and told him to shut up, to remember by whose grace his mother became healthy at all, and not lying vegetable in the orphanage, he ordered to shut up and know your place. During this time John met with Marianne several times and they discussed what was going on. In subtle half hints the girl shared with him information that her brother was planning something. He was requesting permission from the Forest Protection Service for something, he ordered some expensive equipment from America. However, in addition to pressing issues, John talked to Marianne about other things. So, nothing. About life. And it was so strange, but soon it began to seem to him that they had known each other for a long time. Despite the fact that Marianne was also the heiress of a millionaire, she was a very simple girl. She was not torn to brands and the trappings of an expensive life, although it would seem, could get it all literally at the snap of fingers. She was not arrogant. She studied at a prestigious university in London, but now it was on vacation. She was planning to go into business in the future and was doing charity work now. She was so strikingly unlike Elizabeth. What's wrong? John asked when one day Amir gathered them all Selena, him and Elizabeth in his office. Amir smiled lusciously polite and said they would be traveling in a few days. Into the jungle. Because all of Selena's desk work, so to speak, had been done and now it was time for field work. It was, as Amir had said, about archaeology. John's jaw dropped, he didn't want to go on any expedition. Even if it had the coolest equipment, he knew it was bad for Selena. And plus he was also afraid of poisonous snakes and spiders. But it was certainly not honorable to admit such a thing. I'm not offering a choice, Amir said stiffly. I am putting you on notice, out of respect for Selene. That you, he addressed John and Elizabeth, are related to Selene. We move out the day after tomorrow and... At that moment the door to the study opened and Marianne appeared on the threshold. Sister, what are you? Amir started to say, but the girl cut him off. 
you thought you could hide everything from me, brother. So, you decided to continue our father. Narian, it's none of your business. Amir literally shouted. My father. He is my father too. The young girl was not inferior to her brother in ardor and strength of spirit. Well, since I can't stop you from this madness, I'll join you. I can't. I can't afford to lose you too. She finished more calmly. So we'll go into the jungle together to find the lost city of the Cobra Emperor. John felt like a tiny splinter floating in a raging torrent, and he wondered where the current would take him. John had never been camping in his life. No way. An ordinary trip to his distant relative's dacha was not a pleasant adventure for him. So he was incredibly relieved that he didn't have to do or carry anything. All he had to do was to get into one of the dark green SUVs and, as Amir politely but steely Amir had hinted, be a good boy. John thought that if he had a little more fortitude, he'd give that crazy millionaire a whack for being a good boy. But alas, he was at his mercy. And he was not so much afraid for the safety of his carcass as worried about not worsening his mother's situation. Besides, of course, he did not want to make her worry. John really hoped that Elizabeth would not drag herself with them. Amir said that she was a woman and could refuse. But the wife said she would go with her husband. And the reason she had, as John regretfully realized, was. It was that a couple of days ago she caught him with Marianne. Well, as caught simply he and his sister Amira met in a secluded corner of the Rose Garden, and somehow Elizabeth had wandered there too. Marianne left in a hurry. Who was it? The wife insisted. John tried to deflect, saying it was a servant. Well, a servant, Elizabeth said, and he realized she did not believe him a bit. And after she had seen Marianne in the study with her own eyes, naturally, these suspicions only increased. However, John realized that a jealous wife was the least of his problems. He did not understand much about it, but everything was read automatically Amir prepared very seriously. Into the jungles in the depths of India came a well-organized group. There were scientists, the usual support staff type assistants, a few doctors, and even heavily armed mercenaries. Look, what's this cursed city? John asked Marion when they stopped for the night on the third night of their journey. Fires were burning, strange sounds came from the never-sleeping jungle, birds chirping, insects buzzing, monkeys growling, well, or some other animals. I didn't even want to think about what kind. John walked over to the fire where Marion and some other guy with glasses were sitting. She introduced him as Gregory, a specialist in local folklore, who had come at Amur's invitation from Canada. He told the legend. The legend said that once the people in these lands were not free, they were ruled by the cruel Emperor Kogra, half serpent and half man. He loved to be honored with gems, gold, and young, beautiful virgins. For a thousand years, people lived under this oppression. But then a brave hero magician came along and imprisoned the monster in his underground city, which became his tomb. It was sought by many, and the legend said that whoever could find it would gain unprecedented power and wealth and would most likely die before you use it, Marion finished, because the underground city is full of death traps, and the ruler's curse will fall on the finder and his entire family. John was quite satisfied with the answer. Indeed, it is only the curse of the legendary city of the fantasy creature, and everyone knows curses don't exist, so they have nothing to fear, right? John slept badly that night. Let go, he said to his wife and moved away from her as far as the sleeping place in the tent allowed, it was hot, but really he just didn't like her touch. The next day they moved deep into the jungle again. Sometimes it seemed to John that they were now stuck here forever, and the civilized world was nothing more than an illusion. They had little contact with Selena these days. It seemed that this journey was not easy for her mother, so while she was not checking old maps and records, she was mostly asleep or discussing something with Amir. They had been on the road for over a week now, but finally it stopped. John didn't understand at first why there was such a commotion, but when he saw it with his own eyes, he froze. Because up ahead, in the jungle, there was a cliff. It might have appeared to be just a stone wall, but when it was cleared of vines, it became clear that it was covered with skillful bass reliefs depicting men and snakes, some mystical creatures, the moon and stars. We'd have found the underground city, said Marion. It's real. John nodded. They had so far seen only the facade of what for centuries had been considered a fiction, but he was already impressed. True, it was an impression with a bad feeling. Literally in a day, a new plan was prepared, during which Amir zealously argued with a group of scientists 
who, judging by the intonation of their foreign speech John did not understand, tried to change the millionaire's mind, but he insisted on his own. To several of the most powerful SUVs were attached steel cables. Their hooks were fixed in that part of the bass relief, behind which presumably could hide the entrance to the dungeon. At first nothing worked, the cables banally broke off. Then they added one more machine to the two machines and fixed the hooks in a different position and on a larger recess. And that's when a part of the bass relief collapsed with a wild rumble. Now there was a black hole gaping in its place. John watched distantly as people around him shouted and cheered as scientists rejoiced at the selenium of what they had achieved and took a photo as a memento. It's not good, suddenly said Marion who came up to him. What happened? Nearby recorded earth tremors, replied the girl. In this place is supposedly a fault in the earth's crust. We do not know whether there will not be an earthquake in here. But in any case, my brother is definitely crazy. They, the girl was talking about the scientists. They looked inside. There's a gape or something. If you go down deeper, you can't open it the same way. Amir wants to use explosives. Wow, he's a risky guy, John shook his head. But it's dangerous, isn't it? The whole thing could collapse. I don't know, sighed Marion. Maybe the ancient builders made it strong enough. I'm more worried about something else. She stopped talking, looking at her feet. My brother says. He says he hears the call of the Cobra Emperor. What do you mean? John didn't understand. Directly. Marion's cheeks were flaming with excitement, tears shining in her eyes. He says he's talking to him in his head, and he wants a mirror to release him. John did not know what to say here. But he really did not like it. In general, he thought that, in theory, everyone can believe in what he wants. But he also seriously feared that what Amur believes in will not create problems for all of them. They planned to enter the underground city the day after tomorrow. The first night was cloudless, although in principle, the weather forecasters said that now was the time for heavy rains. John couldn't sleep. He decided to talk to his mother about everything that was troubling him, and he wasn't afraid to disturb his peace anyway. The light was on in Celine's tent. She was leaning over her maps again. I do what I have to do. She answered after his long speech, the essence of which was to Celine. That she, his mother, certainly owed Amir a lot, but she did not have to destroy her barely acquired health. You know, son, I didn't want to say this, but tell me, why do you care so much just now? What do you mean? John asked. Well, I remember you were so easily ready to send me to boarding school. Mom. Well, how many times? John was very hard. He was a fool. He thought we couldn't cope. You needed constant care. Elizabeth couldn't cope. And she didn't even try. What? John didn't understand. No reason. Selena grinned wryly. You know, I see what's going on. I see that your wife. I can imagine how it will be when it's over. All she wants is the money. And she. Selena couldn't take it anymore and told him how Elizabeth had treated her. John couldn't believe what he heard Selena say. Or, rather speaking now, after seeing how Elizabeth was able to change, he could believe it. And that was the worst part. He told his mother he had to think about it. He left her tent and went to his own. Elizabeth stood nearby and flirted with one of the taller guards. Needing to talk, John grabbed his wife under her arm without any tenderness and dragged her away. Put her in front of him and looked into her eyes. Tell me the truth. Mom told me everything. As he spoke, Elizabeth's expression changed from pitiful to cold and contemptuous. And what did you want? Suddenly she almost shrieked. That I put my young life on your old woman on this invalid? I thought I was marrying a normal man. And you, I couldn't earn anything, nothing. She pushed him away. I hate you. Elizabeth said everything she thought about John's mother, about him, about the kind of life she wanted. Well, what can I say? John said in a colorless voice. So the divorce. What? Exclaimed Elizabeth, almost choking with indignation. It's because of you. You know, you can even go to the jungle or to a meter. I do not care. Do whatever you want. John said, he waved his hand and walked away. John decided to ask one of the scientists for a tent, and he was surprised by his strange request. But he let him in and even shared a spare sleeping bag. All the next day the jungle was drowning in humid, sun-drenched heat. Scientists were carrying equipment to the underground city, making necessary calculations. Marion was among them, so John had little opportunity to talk to her face to face. 
but it was necessary to talk. He realized that he had something important to say to this girl. In general, he dared not even hope that something was possible between them because they belonged to different worlds. And yet he felt, knew he had to tell her that he was leaving his wife. For some reason, it was infinitely important. The opening of the main part of the underground city of the palace was scheduled for the next day, and John decided that he would intercept Marion for a conversation early in the morning. Now he was going to sleep, this time in his own tent, because it was just uncomfortable to crowd that scientist. And what am I waiting for? John stopped halfway and resolutely turned back. He would talk to Marianne right now. However, the girl was not in her tent, and when he went around the camp, he did not see her. It became alarming. And then John remembered that he had not seen his wife tonight, and these two facts seemed strange to him. And not good. He suddenly imagined that Elizabeth, no, it was nonsense. Why would she try to do Marianne any harm? Joan stood in the middle of the expedition camp, thinking about all this. Then his attention was drawn to a small gathering of scientists, lent by his mother, who were discussing something heatedly. He approached them. It turned out that no one could find a mirror. It was as if he had vanished. A few people decided that they should go around the perimeter of the place, in case he decided to go into the jungle for some reason, for example, attracted by a suspicious rustle. John did not join anyone because he realized that he would only hinder the professionals and he himself does not understand anything about searching in the forest. And yet, some thoughts were rattling in his mind threateningly and lazily, like a tangle of snakes. Something was there that he missed. John jumped up precisely. He suddenly remembered Marion talking about her brother supposedly hearing the call of the Cobra Emperor. What if he, following this, of course, imaginary call, decided to go down into the ruins towards the city? John rushed to the people he tried to explain to them what was the matter. However, those of the guys who remained in the camp spoke Spanish and French, and his weak English was not understood at all. Besides, the scientists and even Selena had gone to look for the already and remained mostly here guards and she, as John realized from the violent gesticulation, flatly refused to leave their places, that is to leave unattended machines and expensive equipment. No way, waving his hand, John grabbed the first flashlight he could find and decided that he would go and check everything himself. Not that he was worried about Amir, but he thought that if the man was glitching, he might break his legs on those underground staircases. So, on a sudden impulse, John went on his way. Suddenly he froze, the bushes rustled. His body was chained with icy fear. What if it was a tiger? What are you doing here? Marion came at him with a question. Looking for you, Elizabeth and Amir, John sighed with relief. The others are looking too. My brother was talking to your wife about something and then they left, muttered Marianne. I don't know why, but I wanted to check here. Me too, John nodded. Shall we go together then? And they moved on. At first he thought they were lost, the vines were tangled under their feet, and the ghostly glow of the moon was hidden by the spreading crowns. But then he realized that there was a path, which meant that he was moving in the right direction. True, John thought, the others must have been here before, and if Amir was here, they had found him. Maybe everyone, including Elizabeth, had already gone back. I wonder what they were talking about. John wouldn't be surprised to learn that Liska was being taken in as Amir's mistress and keeper. But he thought loadingly, she was no model, why would a millionaire want her? Suddenly, the jungle ended abruptly and he found himself at the very wall. Up and beyond were rocks. John incredulously shined his flashlight forward blackness. Amir, he called out. Amir, repeated louder, so that the echo heard. Nothing, I think. John did not want to go down at all. He even had time to curse himself, saying, what a fool, where is dragged, when everyone has already gone to look for, and without him perfectly manage. Do you peer? Marion asked him. And then he really heard something. A thin, distant and close at the same time, a woman's cry. It was Elizabeth's voice. John, not remembering himself, rushed down and forward. He had heard the expression blood runs cold in his veins before. And now that's exactly what happened to him from the picture that opened before him. At the bottom of the steps, where there was a small platform in front of the stone gate doors, Elizabeth was lying there. His wife was bound hand and foot, and over her stood a mirror. The moon at these moments slightly changed his position in the heavens and its pale rays slipped into the opening of the cave entrance, 
reflected in the glow on what the man clutched with his hands it was a dagger. What are you, John began. Help! Elizabeth shouted. What a nuisance, Amir muttered. Get away from her? John took a step forward, froze. Because the dagger soared over the figure of the lying girl and hovered. What? What are you doing? Please. John raised his hands. I don't have a weapon. Don't touch her. Amir, wake up. Shocked Marion exclaimed. I'm afraid it's impossible, Amir said in a colorless, almost as if not his own voice. My lord longs for freedom. And this, alas, is impossible without a small offering. What are you saying? John could hardly digest what he heard. You want to sacrifice her. Do you believe this crap? That there's a demon sleeping here, half man, half snake? Amir, please. Marion dropped tears. You don't realize what you're doing. Please, let's go. Tomorrow the tomb will be opened. Everything will be done as it should be done. Please, brother, please, for our father's sake, please. Hey, John had an idea. Shouldn't innocent girls be sacrificed to that thing? Elizabeth hasn't been like this for a long time. Amir thought for a while. Then he grimaced. He kicked the prey lying at his feet. It'll do. It was just the easiest thing to do with her. Imagine, your wife thought that we could have something. He grinned. What an idiot she is. Maybe she is, John sighed. But she's a human being. You can't. You think that, when he comes into the world, Amir said pathetically. Nothing will matter anymore. I will stand at his throne and the world will be ruled by the original tribe that came from the Great Egg. He's crazy, John said. But he did not understand how Elizabeth could be saved now, for the madman held a dagger over her. Suddenly something changed around him. It was like a rumbling sound. Quiet, but growing, as if it were coming from the depths of the earth. The great serpent rises from oblivion. Amir shouted, throwing back his head. An earthquake, explained Elizabeth. And then all mixed up as if in a monstrous kaleidoscope. John realized that from the ceiling began to fall stones. Here one of them fell directly on the head of Amir, who managed to run to Marion. The man fell to the floor, the dagger fell out of his hands. John realized that at any moment they would be buried under the stones, and they would lie here for maybe 200 years until the next archaeological expedition. He picked up the dagger and cut the bindings on Elizabeth's arms and legs, pushed her up and shouted to her. Run! He realized that it would have been much easier for them to leave the lunatic here. But, instead, he and Marion carried Amir out of the cave on their backs. They had no sooner moved a couple of meters away from it and the cavity behind them closed under a deafening rockfall. The whole trio fell to the grass. John was gasping with excitement and the weight of Amir, who was unconscious. He barely realized that from the jumbled people ran out to them those who were looking for the missing. But, as it turned out, in the wrong direction. The events of the next few weeks merged for John into a motley, orderly, but still crazy kaleidoscope. The expedition had to be called off for two reasons. First, the cave collapsed. And the scientists said that to dig up to the city will now be possible, but with the help of destroying part of the mountain, and for this and a hundred years will not get permission. Secondly and more importantly, Amir went mad. Marion was forced to urgently take over the management of the entire family business. Elizabeth, after going through the shock of nearly being sacrificed, desperately begged John to forgive her, but he said there would be a divorce. Then he put his wife on a plane and sent her home. He couldn't bear to see her around anymore. Elizabeth, on the other hand, was happy to leave India as soon as possible. Selena suffered a great shock, but fortunately, as examinations showed, her condition did not worsen. And then John dared to talk to his mother. He asked, well, how went to go home? I don't want to go home, Selena replied. Marion offers me a job at the local museum. She wants to give their part of the collection of my grandfather and father. I will be useful here. Mom, John said. But where? Family? Then Selena told her son that this is how they are family. She said that she forgave him for his near betrayal. But she knows for a fact she has a chance to do something that makes her feel truly alive and needed. She said she didn't want to be a burden to her son, who, of course, will want to find a new wife. After all, he's a young guy, he has his own life. Don't worry about me, Selena smiled. I'll have a good salary here, I'll manage. And then, maybe I'll come back later. But for now there's a lot of work. John had to agree with her decision, 
and he was also not happy that Marion, apparently feeling guilty in front of this family, offered him a huge sum of money. John refused. Why? He had enough of what he had, what he could earn. And he also could not admit to her that the saddest thing was that, he realized he and Marion are still quite different, they couldn't be together. She felt nothing for him at all. It was only when the plane soared into the air, bringing him home, that John felt a little better. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel, like it, write comments if you like the story, and see you on the channel.